Good morning. My name is Douglas Griffin. This is my Sunday school class. We're going through the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Now we're in the book of Numbers. Uh, again, reminding you that the children of Israel have been taken out of Egypt. They've been brought to Mount Sinai to meet with God. God shows up. Actual God shows up. Clouds, thunder, lightning, the voice, the whole thing. They've never had that experience while in Egypt. While in Egypt, they worshipped the Egyptian God for a couple hundred years and never had any sort of experience like this. But still, in their brains, he's the God of the mountain. We met him in the mountain. They've been inundated or with the idea, indoctrinated with the idea that there are different gods for different regions. And they don't know if this God will go with them or not to the next place. Maybe there's another bigger, fiercer God in that other place because they've only been in Egypt. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived in Israel. But as soon as Jacob had his 12 kids, they moved down to uh, Egypt to get food and stayed there. And for four generations, we've been in Egypt. That's all they know. So God is trying to teach them to trust him. You'll see what he did to do that and their reaction to it. So he's brought them to the Mount, Mount Amorite, basically. It, it's a Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea, but why would you care what the name of it is? But he's brought them to this place that's right before the Promised Land. They could look down over the mountain and say, there's the Promised Land that God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's, it's ours. God told us he'd bring us here. Let's go in. I just want to remind you what they did. So starting, so again, we're in Numbers chapter 14. Starting in Deuteronomy chapter 1, because Deuteronomy gives you a fuller account, a fuller summary of everything that happened while they were in the wilderness. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 21. Moses says, look, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it as the Lord your God of your fathers has spoken to you. Go possess it. I've already given it to you. Here's the keys to this brand new house I gave you. Go on and move in. Uh, do not fear or be discouraged. Verse 22. And every one of you came near to me and said, eh, let us send men before us and let them search out the land for us and bring back words to us of the way by which we should go up. That's all. We're not doubting God. They're just going to tell us, should we go this way or that way? Now, I don't know. This is kind of facetious because the cloud had been leading them all this time. If they should go to the left or the right, they were just supposed to follow the cloud. But at a certain point, we think, well, God's done his part. He gave me a really good Sunday. But Monday's up to me, so I'm going to leave God at home. And because I got to drive the freeway and then however I get there, that's up to me or I got to pay my taxes. God blessed me. But now that I got to pay my pa taxes, let me cheat here and cheat there. We just think there are areas that are just not God's expertise. So let us uh, send men for, uh, before us and let them search out the land for us and bring back words to us by which way we should go up and of the cities into which we shall come, you, you know. They've got to tell, because God's speaking to Moses, not really to us. Well, we know that God gave them a chance on Mount Sinai to have the very same Moses experience. But they said, no, Moses, you talk to God. We don't want to talk to God. He says, okay, I'll talk to God. Uh, so we don't know anything about these cities. God's just talking to you, and we have to depend on you to tell us what God says. And Let's send our own men. So the suggestion came from the people. Here was God's reaction because, again, he knows in advance what's going to happen. He knows us. He knows what we're going to, choices we're going to make. Numbers 13, verse 1 says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, verse 2, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. Go ahead, send them. Because it's just something going to reveal what they're really thinking. So God will say, don't do that. And we go, nobody really want to do that. And God will say, okay, go, go ahead and do that. Because it's going to reveal who you really are. So send a man from each tribe of the fathers. You to send a man, everyone, a leader among them. Go ahead, send them out. 
chapter Numbers chapter 13, verse 25, the spies come back. It says, and they return from spying out the land after 40 days. Now, 40 days, God uses that as a time of testing to see whether you're going to freak out or not. As in Genesis chapter 7, verse 17, where it says, now the flood was on the earth 40 days. That was a time of testing for Noah and his family. Are they going to stay in the ark? Are they going to panic? Are they going to think, this ark's going to blow up? It's going to, oh my God, let's get a... Exodus chapter 24, verse 18. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. They had the same, should we panic? Are we going to give up? Because again, in the ark, no one of them could say, okay, God's never going to stop this rain. It's going to, because it rained for 40 days. This is terrible. We're doomed. We're all going to die. When Moses went up the mountain to talk to God, God made sure it was 40 days. So that the people could say, wow, he's talking to God. This is fantastic. Or we don't know if he's coming, which is what they said. We don't know when Moses is coming back down. He may have died up there in that mountain. We should go back to Egypt. A test reveals to a teacher how much you know, what you believe of what he's taught or he or she's taught, right? Here's the test. Show me what you know. God does the same thing. Here's the test. Let's see if you pass. Let's see if you believe what I was teaching you, if you took it in or not. So for 40 days, the spies are gone. During that 40 day period, the people are either going, oh, this is going to be really great. Once we get to that land, I'm going to build a house. I'm going to have me an ice cream stand. Or this is crazy. I wonder if we should go back. We've never been to this land before. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they could have been crazy who think they were talking to God. We don't. Either one thing is going on or the other. So either they learned the lessons from God or they did not. Numbers chapter 13, verse 27. Then they told him and said, this is what the spies said when they came back. We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. And last week we talked about Anak, the giant the grandfather of Goliath and his four brothers. There were five brothers. That's why David took five pebbles, because he didn't know if all five of them were going to be there. Only one was there. So later on, they slowly took out the other four. Verse 33 of Numbers 13. And there we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants it says in Numbers 13, 33. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. So they're assuming what the other person feels. That's where we always mess up. Assuming what the other person is thinking. We think we really know. They hate me. Or sometimes, oh, they love me. Or whatever. That would be my, my thing. Uh, and we don't know what that other person knows or thinks. Or We're like grasshoppers to them. They're, they're going to just smash us. And apparently, in their mind, they're bigger than God. And they just don't trust God. They just don't trust God. So Moses, during the next 40 years, is compiling the book Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He probably has scribes who are helping him write it. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, because there's this giant issue. God, they saw giant. Now, there were no giants in Egypt, but there were giants who were two or three feet taller than him. So it'd be like going to an NBA game and standing next to Shaquille O'Neal. Pretty intimidating. But he's not 90 feet tall and can smash people and step on their heads. Uh, but anyway, they're giants. They had never seen giants before. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, that's why Moses wrote, there were giants on the earth in those days. He's talking about before the flood. And also afterward. He's talking about after the flood. So this is not a new thing. You're running, oh my God, they're giants. Yes, there have always been giants. Numbers chapter 14 now. I'm starting our lesson. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. So that was a reaction. They could have said, you guys are the worst spies ever. All we told you was to find a way that we should go, because that's what we told Moses. We're just looking for the way to go. But not... They bought every word of it. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept 
that night. Big God over here, the big cloud, thundering voice said, go. These 12 people came back and said, we can't go. So they cried all night. Oh my God, he's gonna, God gonna make us go? This is terrible, we can't go. So verse two of Numbers chapter 14. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation and said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, because they're thinking, at least it would have been comfortable. We would have known where we were. Uh, I could have died in my own bed. And there are people who think that. Okay, so if only we had died in the land of Egypt, and or if only we had died in this wilderness, but you're going to make us die in this new place? Verse 3, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, this new land, that our wives and children should become victims? Because we're not... I'm not concerned about myself. I'm concerned about the, the, the children. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. So thank you, Moses. Uh, don't call us. We've got your application, but we're going to get a new leader. Thank you so much. Verse 5, then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of Israel. Why did they fall on their faces? Because this is an act of... I'm so desperate, I've got to do something physical to let you know that you're making the wrong decision. So they would fall on their face and grovel in the dirt. It was a sign, you've done the wrong thing. And I'm falling on my face because I am that convinced, right? In Leviticus chapter 10, verse 6, after God judged Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's oldest two sons, Moses' nephews, after he judged them. Verse 6 says, And Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and Ithamar, his son. So Aaron had two other sons, Eleazar and Ithamar. He says, Do not uncover your heads, nor tear your clothes, because that would, that you, would, you, would, you would do that, you would tear clothes, and then you would throw yourself on the ground. He says, Don't even get started. Do not uncover your heads, nor tear your clothes, lest you die and wrath come upon you and come upon all the people. Don't do that and weep and cry and t fall on your face because you'll be saying to God, you have made the wrong decision. He says, but let your brethren, meaning your cousins, the whole house of Israel, let them be well the burning which the Lord has kindled. They can do it, but you've got to stand here and let everybody know this was the right decision. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 29. Here's what Moses said when they got on the ground. It's not in the book of Numbers, but it's in Deuteronomy. So Moses and Aaron falling on the ground. Oh my God, you're making the wrong choice. They said, it says, then I said to you, Moses is recapping in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 29. Then I said to you, do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. He's the same God that's been with us in this wilderness all this time. He said, God, he'll fight for you. According to what he did in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Every day he said, hello. But Joshua, so the people are like, no, we don't want to hear it. Numbers chapter 14, verse 6. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, because they were two of the spies who went in, two of the 12 spies, says, who were among those who had spied out the land and tore their clothes, verse 7 of Numbers 14. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, the land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not rebel against the Lord. That's the name of the lesson. Do not rebel against the Lord, right? Um, only do not rebel against the Lord. Uh, see how I did. The Lord you got to go before you fight. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Like we can eat them up. Their protection has departed from them. 
their protection has departed from them. What does that mean? Well, God had already told Abraham exactly when the children of Israel were supposed to come into the land and what they would encounter there. In Genesis chapter 15, when God's talking to Abraham when he's first called them out, says, from you and your descendants, I'm going to give them this land. Genesis 15, 13, then he said to Abram, his name wasn't Abraham at the time, know certainly that your descendants will be stranger in a land that is theirs, that is not theirs, I'm sorry, and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. So he says, and again, um, the King James doesn't do total justice of this, but know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. Separately, they will become servants and they will be afflicted. And all this will be a 400 year period. So starting from the time that Abraham heard this prophecy until they ended up coming back to that same place was 400 years. For 200 years, he, Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, because it was 25 more years before Abraham even had Isaac. And Isaac was however old before he had Jacob and Jacob was ever old. It was 200 years went by. Because I think Isaac was like 80 before he had kids. I don't know why people, how is that possible? Anyway, so, and then I, okay, so the first 200 years was spent there. Then they went to Egypt 200 years and now they're back. He said 400 years. Verse 14, and also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. And afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried, buried at a good old age. Buried at a good old age. You're not going to see all of this, but I'm telling you in advance. But in the fourth generation, they shall return. So after they go to that land, you're going to be here for a couple of years, and then that land for a couple of years. In the fourth generation, they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So my hand of protection is still on them. They haven't sinned enough. Again, it's like a measuring cup and you're pouring in bleach. And once you get to the top, you go, okay, no farther. You reach the top. So that word complete, the, their sin is not yet complete. They haven't sinned enough for me to sit and move my hand and say, okay, I'm giving you over to destruction. Kind of say God will do that to us sometimes if our sin becomes so great. He in the Bible says, give that person over to destruction of their flesh so that their soul might be saved. I've now got to let things start happening to this person so that they don't end up renouncing me and ending up eternally in hell. So they're living such a riotous life, such a raucous, they're doing so many things bad that now I've got to start allowing bad things to happen to them so that they can wake up. Kind of a prodigal son thing. Let him eat with the pigs and he'll look up and go, oh, okay, and go back. So I'm taking my hand off the Amorites. They're, they're, it'll be 400 years before they have sinned so much that their protection is gone. And so that's what Josh was saying. Their protection is gone. The biggest chapter 18, verse 24 says, Do not defile, defile yourselves with any of these things that the people will be doing in the land in which I'm going to send you. For by all these the nations are defiled, which I'm casting out before you. So those nations that are in the new land don't do any of those things that they're, because they're all, they defile themselves by doing these terrible things. Verse 25 says, for the land is defiled, therefore I visit the punishment of its iniquity upon it. So it's gotten so bad, now the consequences are coming and the land will vomit out its inhabitants. So it's, so he says this, a few months before he's about to send them in. That's why I'm, I am visiting punishment now on them. They're going to lose all these battles because I've been merciful for 400 years and they've just gotten worse and worse and worse and now the land's going to vomit them out. So when you have poison in the system, they say induce vomiting, I've got to get rid of this poison. Uh, so everyone, they knew that back then. They didn't need a label on the back of some uh, turpentine to know that it was you swallow poison, you got to vomit it out. Numbers chapter 14, verse 9, the second part of verse 9. So he says, their protection is gone, 
and the Lord is with us, so do not fear them. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 32 says, Yet for all that, you did not believe the Lord your God. So Moses and Aaron fell on their face and said, Please don't do this. Joshua and Caleb, two of the spies, said, Please don't do this. Verse 32, yet for all that, of Deuteronomy chapter 1, yet for all that, you, you did not believe the Lord your God? Okay, so back to the book of Numbers chapter 14, just filling in some gaps. Verse 10, and all the congregation said to stone them with stones. So that's how they reacted to Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb. Uh, kill them. They're trying to say we should believe God. I don't think so. And they're thinking in their mind, they're trying to get us killed. And sometimes people can totally misread God. They're not doing it on purpose, but they have a whole other agenda in their head. And what they think is the devil is actually God. Okay. Now, the glory of the Lord appeared at this point. After Moses has said, repent, Aaron, Joshua, Caleb. Now God's there. You don't want that. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the congregation, before all the children of Israel. Okay, you've had four chances to be talked out of this craziness. And your answer was to try to kill Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb. Okay, then the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me? With all the signs which I have performed among them, I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. So God's doing two things. He's declaring his, what's, his consequences for these people's act, but he's also still teaching Moses empathy and to be an intercessor. So here's what I'm about to do, Moses because he needs to, Moses has to be trained to react in a certain way. As far as, even when you see some bad thing about to happen to somebody, you see somebody making a bad decision, you still pray for them, you still intercede for them. You don't think, well, that's what they get. Because we're not God. We don't get to stand in the position of judge. And Because God knows, well, when they deserve it, but he still wants us to pray for somebody, not say, there, I hope they all fall into the ditch. No. You, we hope that they see the light. We hope that they turn around. So he's doing these two things. Let me give a prompt to Moses by saying, I'm going to, I'm going to kill them all, and I'll make out of you a nation greater and mightier than they. So verse 13, Moses responded properly. Moses said to the Lord, well, but then the Egyptians will hear about it. For, for by your might, you brought these people up from among them. Now he's threatening to kill them all. God wasn't going to kill them all. But he's talking in extreme for Moses. Well, then the Egyptians will hear that you killed everybody. For, for by your might you brought these people up from among the Egyptians, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land that they have heard that you, Lord, are among these people, that, that you, Lord, are seen face to face in your cloud stands above them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So they're going to say, this Lord, this Lord that they're talking about, he was with them. He was in the middle of them. He led them. He did all, And then he had to end up killing them all. Verse 15. Now, if you kill these people as one man, then the nations which have heard of your fame will speak, saying, huh, because the Lord was not able to bring this people to the land which he swore to them. Therefore, he killed them in the wilderness because he just wasn't powerful enough. So verse 17. And now I pray because he's thinking because he's really just talking his own thoughts like, you know, I don't like these people even more than you don't like them, God. But if you make a nation mightier than me, this, your reputation will have already gone before you that you had to, you know, you're not strong, you're not mighty. Moses is thinking that's not going to help me. Because for a second, maybe you should kill them all. But that won't help me because these nations will not be afraid of me and this brand new nation of people because they'll say, well, their God that follows that guides them and leads them. He's not able to protect them. He had to kill them all. So, verse 17, Moses gets to the good part. And now, I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, the power that you told me about, just as you have spoken. Remember when you said this on the mountain, on Mount Sinai, when you took me by yourself, saying, 
The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity. So he, God's describing himself. Now, all these things, God is just, God is merciful, God is righteous. They are all three true at the same time. So he says, first you said, this is how you describe yourself. The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and, trans transgression, and transgression, but he by no means... By, by no means clears the guilty. So he's not stupid. Uh, he's forgiving, but people who are per consistently sinning and, and challenging him and rejecting him, he doesn't clear them and say, oh, well, you know, that's how they are. So he's balanced, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation, which actually I'm going to preach on today. So I'm not going to get into it, today, but to the, in today's service, I'm preaching that. Uh, what did God mean? This, is there actually a curse on people that's visited to the third and fourth generation? If what your, does what your great-grandfather did affect you? Is God punishing you for his sin? But he says, pardon, verse, verse 19, pardon the iniquity of these people. So he balanced it out. You're, you're merciful and long-suffering, and yet you still bring consequences. You're both. In this case, he says, pardon the iniquity of the people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy. Just as you've forgiven this people from Egypt even till now. So, then the Lord said, I've pardoned according to your word. So I'm not going to wipe them all out. Now, again, God didn't go, uh, Moses is smarter than me. He already knew what he was going to do but he's training Moses because Moses had an anger problem. That's why Moses was in the wilderness for 40 years by himself in the first place because he wanted to get away from those people. He did not like them. Moses had an anger problem. He saw an Egyptian mistreating a, an Israelite and he killed the Egyptian. So Moses had an anger problem. So I need, so God's retraining Moses too. And okay, so. I have pardoned according to your word. Uh, and it's instant. Here's what's so good. It's not instant. It's not, well, let me think about it. I'll get back to you in a month. For example, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, when David had sinned by having Bathsheba's husband killed, verse 13 says, So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord, once he realized. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has also put away your sin. You should not die. That easy. Forgiveness comes instantly. However, verse 14 of 2 Samuel says, because by this deed you have given great occasions to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, there's going to be consequences, but not the punishment that would have come. But there still must be some uh, fallback, fallout from what you did. So, he says, I have part of them, I will not kill them. Back to Numbers chapter 14, verse 21. But truly as I live... All the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. So I still have to teach a lesson. So because if you simply ignore sin and ignore sin and ignore sin, and there aren't consequences of some kind, then people think, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. What I did was fine. So you don't get, we don't get the punishment we deserve, but we still have to learn a lesson from it, right? And he says, well, the earth's still going to be filled with glory. Well, that's my ultimate goal, is to fill the earth, to use all these things that people are doing wrong, to give them more knowledge of me. Uh, so, verse 22, Numbers 14, verse 22. Because all of these men, so here's why the consequence is coming, who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in, G in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have put me to the test now these ten times, God was counting. Well, he didn't have to count. He can just look back. One, two, three, four, three. Okay. They put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice. So let's go over the ten things that, Jesus, that God did from the, from the time they left Egypt to right then. Ten times that they tempted God and put him to the test. At the Red Sea, Exodus chapter 4. This is in chronological order. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 10, here's what the people said. 
And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. Not, thank you for everything that happened. I know he's going to rescue us. There, there, weren't no great, there weren't enough room. So you said, oh, I know, I'll kill them in the wilderness. Why have you dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? We didn't say we wanted to leave Egypt. What? That's all you were saying. Okay. We never said we wanted to leave the Egyptians. And why'd you bring us out here? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. So we love serving the Egyptians. We were not complaining for 200 years. Uh, and that's how they're testing God. This is how they're getting in God's nerve. You can be scared and nervous, but then to accuse God of foolishness. That's, he has a problem with that. God, you're wrong. You're messing up. But that's what we are doing sometimes when we see something happen. Well, God, you messed up. You know, uh oh, <clears throat> you cannot like it, but don't, don't come at me. That's what that Job's friends charge God with foolishness. Well, you uh, and made Job charge God with foolishness. Well, God messed up. That's when God shows up and says, wait, 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 let me straighten this out. Number two, at Mara, Exodus chapter 15, verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. So, oh, God rescued them. Brought them from the Red Sea. Then they went out to the wilderness of Shur, and they were three days in the wilderness, and they found no water. So the response should have been, Lord, we know you're going to provide water for us. You just parted the Red Sea. But now when they came to Mara and they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter, therefore the name of it was called Mara. And the people complained again. Moses says, what shall we drink? How, but like they didn't, like how could, you know, God, what's God going to do? God's messing up. In the wilderness of sin, Zen, really, number three, Exodus chapter 16, verse two. Then the whole congregation of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. So he, he turned the bitter water and made it sweet. And again, it's, it's not that you can't be surprised by something, but our attitude has to say, oh, Lord, I didn't know that was going to happen. Well, Lord, I know you've got this under control. I know you've got a plan, and I'm not going to act like you don't have a plan and get all crazy. You, this thing that I did not expect, you knew was coming. So I'm not happy about it, but I know, you, I know it's for the best, and I know that you're going to, that's fine. But acting like, okay, Lord, what are you going to do now? I bet you didn't know about this. We're stuck. We're mad. We should have just, you should, I shouldn't have been following you, God. So, and the children of Zin, the whole congregation of the children of Israel, this is Exodus verse 16, Exodus chapter 16, verse 2, complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. He was part of the Red Sea. He just turned the bitter waters, made them sweet. The children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by our pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the full, for you had brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now he's, okay, so God's through with them. So time number four, Exodus chapter 16. So he provides manna. Here, here's manna. Part of the Red Sea, made the bitter water sweet, I provided manna. He tells them in verse 19 of Exodus 16, let no one leave any of it till morning. You're going to get new in the morning. Don't say, ooh, we better save some of it because God may fall asleep and forget to bring us some more. It would be like your child, your three-year-old saying, I better put some of this away because mommy, you know, sometimes she, she doesn't get, well, hey, that may be true with some mommies. But anyway, it's like you've been feeding them every day, but they just don't trust you all of a sudden. I better put a stake under my bed just in case, uh, mom, you know. So he says, don't leave any of it till morning. I'm going to feed you every day. He said, notwithstanding, verse 20 of Exodus 16, they didn't heed Moses, but some of them left part of it to morning. Because what if God forgot? And it bred worms and stank, and Moses was angry with them. Because I said, don't, just eat it all. That number five, Exodus chapter 16, verse 26, he says, six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. So don't go out and look for it on the seventh day. Verse 27, now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day together, but they found none. Because they just, uh, I don't believe you. Number six, at Rephidim, Exodus chapter 17. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of Zin, according to the command of the Lord, and they camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. 
So they're, they should have said, well, Lord, we, you keep providing for us, so we know you're going to provide. Verse 3, and the people thirsted there for water. The people complained against Moses and says, why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? We don't understand. What? Okay. But this is bothering God. Uh, at Horeb, Exodus chapter 32, verse 1. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come and make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what became of him. So here, make it, even though God just showed up and spoke, make us a golden calf. And we, we, we're going back to Egypt because we've had enough of this God, you know, providing every day. We're through with that. Time number eight. When they're leaving at Tabira, Numbers chapter 10, verse 33. So they departed from the mountain of the Lord on a journey of three days. Three days they left the mountain. He gave them the, the uh, Ten Commandments. He gave them all these instructions. He appeared. He forgave them for not, for, for building the golden calf. We're all leaving. Three days. They don't know where they're going. He says, just follow me. Just follow me. And the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord went before them for the three days journey to search out a resting place for them. Now, this is verse 1 of chapter 11, the very next verse. Now, when the people complained, because they're complaining, like, we don't know where we're going. We don't know what we're doing. We're just following this cloud. It's been three days. How come we're not already at the promised land? It displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of them in the outskirts of the camp, because those are the ones who were complaining the most, the people in the outskirts of the heat. So fire's consuming people. I don't know why they're not learning not to complain against God. Nine, at the graves of lust, in Numbers chapter 11, verse 4, it says, now the mixed multitude were among them, it's called the graves of lust, of lust were among them, they yielded to intense craving. That's what the King James. They yielded to lust. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? Because they're sick. Okay. Because they're sick of manna, which is what they asked for. Now they're sick of it. We want to know every day where our meal is coming from. Okay. Every day you wake up, your food will be out there. You don't have to trust me anymore. So five days of manna have gone by. And they, ah, we want some meat. We are sick of this manna. We are killing these. You told us we had to save these sheep for our sin. And no, we're not doing that. We remember the fish, which we ate freely in Egypt, and the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. And people do have a problem with memory. They forget how bad stuff was. We, and, and we look back on our certain days and go, oh, my God, it wasn't that bad. Yes, it was. It was horrible. But we don't remember. So... But, the, but now our whole being is dried up and there's nothing at all except this manna. We are sick of it. We're so upset with you. Okay. But when I was going to do it the other way, you were mad. So, and time number 10. Now they're at Kadesh, Barnea, right? Number 13. So all the people, all the congregation lifted their voices and cried. And people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron because they're about to go into that. So it's time number 10. And the whole congregation said, if only we had died in the land of Egypt or if only we had died in the wilderness, right? So he says, because they've tempted me 10 times, here is their punishment. Because I've revealed who they are. They will never believe me. Because every time that they've complained, they've seen some miracle. And they still don't believe that I'm God of the world. They're, and they're not going to listen to me and they're going to be afraid. So here's their punishment. Verse 23, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to, the, to their fathers. This is Numbers chapter 14, verse 23. Nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. Some of them are going to see it, but not the ones who rejected me. So I can't take them into the promised land because that's, this, they are Egyptians. I need all the Egyptians. To, they were born in Egypt. They believe Egypt ways. They're all going to have to just spend the next years of their life here until they pass away at an old age. But I can't take them to the promised land because this is who they are. I'll never be able to lead them or guide them in the promised land. How, how are they going to fight the Amorites and the Canaan, Canaanites and the Jebusites and all the other ites uh, if they can't trust me? Numbers chapter 14, verse 24. It says, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went 
and his descendants will inherit it. So he gets to go. And and also Jacob, uh, Joshua, but he just mentioned Joshua right here, but Joshua too. Verse 25, now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. So here's your, so here are your instructions now. He, these are your instructions. Tomorrow, turn and move out into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. So I brought you to this uh, place where you could have gone over. Tomorrow morning, get up. I want you to go back toward the Red Sea, but you're not going to go see the land. Verse 26. So that's a very important. Tomorrow, go back to the wilderness by way of the Red Sea. That's my instructions to you. Verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long will I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I've heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. Just the way you spoke and what you said. You don't know what you're doing, God, and we should... We, I'm going to punish you, meet out punishment, matching what you put out at me. You were going to kill Moses and Aaron, Joshua. I'm, this is not in the Bible. I'm just explaining. They had just said, let's kill Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and Caleb. Let's stone them to death and kill them here in the wilderness. So it says in verse 29, the carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in the wilderness. Not Joshua and Caleb. Your carcasses will fall in the wilderness. All of you who were numbered, according to your entire number, from 20 years old and above. Anyone 20 years old and younger, we, you were not part of this rebellion. You didn't lead it. You're not hardened like they are. Luke chapter 19. The reason I have this here is because the same threat where he's saying, tell them, your carcasses will die in the wilderness. This generation, this generation for 40 years, I will slowly die out. And then I will move on. So he's, he's passing out an edict against a generation, a 40-year generation. And says, and then with new people, I will continue my plan. Jesus said the same thing to the Israelites when he came at the end of his ministry he said it at the end of his ministry. He didn't come in, his, in, in at the end of his ministry is when he said it. Luke chapter 19, verse 43. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, close you in on every side, and level you. So he's, he's, he's pronouncing a judgment on an entire generation and saying you're all going to be killed. And your children within you to the ground, they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of this, your visitation. You didn't recognize that God had come among you. You rejected God. And so this whole generation. Now, if God ever shows up big like that, we're held to a higher standard. If you are in the wilderness with God and he's, you see the cloud by day and you see fire leading you by night and you hear it speak and lightning and thunder and manna rains down from heaven and red seas part and bitter waters become sweet and quail show up and all, all these miracles and you still reject it, you get a bigger punishment. We are judged by what we receive and how we respond to it. And uh, so that's why somebody in a desert island somewhere who's never heard the name of Jesus but he looked up at the stars and says, I wonder if there's a God. I bet there's a God up there who made those stars. That's what he'll be judged on. So if all you got was a tiny bit, then... You, but if you got the whole thing, if Jesus shows up and he's walking on water and he's raising the dead and he's healing blind eyes and you still reject it, he says, okay, this whole generation is going to be punished because you didn't recognize the time of your visitation. I was actually here visiting with you and you didn't recognize it. You rejected it. Numbers chapter 14, verse 30. Except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you should by no means, uh, except for them, you should by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones, whom you said would be victims, I will bring in. They shall know the land which you have despised. So the one, oh, we're just trying to protect the children. Oh, don't worry about the children. I've got the children. You, I'm taking care of. No, sir, you will stay here. But your kids, I will bring in. And your sons shall be shepherds. Okay. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness. And your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years. And bear the brunt for your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. Then they'll get to go in. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land. 40 days. 
for each day you shall bear your guilt one year. So 40 days you send people out because you didn't trust me, so that's why I'm making it 40. Namely, 40 years you shall know my rejection. I, the Lord, have spoken this. I will surely do so to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall be consumed, and there they shall die. So he says, Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. That's what Matthew chapter 23, verse 36. All these things are going to come upon this generation. So because they have that burden into their consciousness, how God told a whole generation, I'm judging this whole generation for 40 years, and then I'm going to move on. Jesus says the same thing. He's invoking that same thing to, to the Pharisees. All this is going to come up on this generation. It's going to be a 40-year 40, 40 period. Then I'm going to move on. And so the destruction that Jesus was talking about happened 40 years later. It happened in 70 AD. Jesus started in 30. He died in 30. He, he, the destruction came exactly 40 years later, and that whole generation was wiped out, except for those who believed. They escaped because he said, Here's how you escape. So I'm going to stop there um, because <laughs> they did this amazing thing. Uh, next, it's just fan. It's but I, I've gone on long enough. So um, I will be speaking uh, today at my church. This is for the for the two of you who bless your hearts. Um, so I'll be speaking at my church. Uh, as I told you on Second Samuel, um, and uh, about an hour or more from now, probably around eleven twenty, eleven thirty. Okay. So again, thank you so much for tuning in. I am teaching on the Book of Luke on Wednesdays, and you'll see the parallels because it's really just one book. One is the setup. The New Testament is the payoff for everything in the Old Testament. They're always talking about each other. They're predicting each other or fulfilling each other. It's just one story. It's not, sometimes the Bible's taught us as confusing. Oh, so many books of the Bible. But really, they're all telling the same story. They're all telling the same story. So I hope to be able to present it that way to you. All right. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see you either on Wednesday uh, in an hour and a half from now or next week. All right. Bye-bye.